Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Leader Spotlight this afternoon. Thank you for joining us. We're going to speak with some of the Convergence leaders, and today we have Connie Lippert, Karen Dondi, Marcy Petrini, Donna Foley, Deb Essen, and Giovanna Imperia. Now, these folks are going to be teaching at the Convergence in this July 15 through the 21st, 2022. We are so excited to be back. If you're not familiar with Convergence, it's a seven-day fiber art conference, and it has a variety of activities and classes. We have the exhibits. We have the marketplace where you can check out that loom and test drive that loom. We have the keynotes. We have tours, panels, discussions, and, of course, the runway fashion show. There's a variety of sessions that you can attend at Convergence, everything from a 90 minute seminar to a one, two or three day workshop. And you have to have a membership to take a class. And remember, if you sign up for a CVP, you get 25% off of the classes that you take. We're gonna to start today with Connie Lippert. Connie's gonna talk about the Build a Chipboard Loom, Weave a Pouch. This is a three hour seminar and it's on Monday, July the 18th. Hi, Connie. Hey. Hi, Kathy. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen right quick. Um, let's see. Nope, that didn't work. Okay, did I do something wrong here, Kathy? I was trying to... We're seeing your desktop. Okay. So you can do oh, you a new are? share. Yes. You're seeing it, but I'm not. Okay, now I can see it. Okay, good. There you go. Okay, um, I'm excited to be teaching a, a seminar of uh, use building chipboard looms. And in the seminar, we will also weave a pouch. So basically chipboard, everyone knows what that is. It's just a big sheet of, uh, pressed cardboard or whatever, but it can be cut into any shape that you like uh, on and to make a loom with. Uh, as an example, this is a little mug rug. I've just cut out a six by six square. This is the top right is the front and the bottom right is the bottom. And then when it's finished, we cut ac across the middle of the bottom and tie um, knots in the ends. Uh, you can make any shape, a bookmark. Uh, this is a little tapestry sample. And for this, for most of the time, I put the warp on so that it just goes in little notches at the end of the chipboard. And then when I'm finished, I just take my thumb and push those notches off and I have a fringeless weaving. This is a tapestry sampler. It was also done with the same uh, warp through the notches. And at the end, we just slipped the, the loops off and put the board through to hang it and then tied the other end. Um, this is a, actually a bag with the plain weave on the back and a tapestry with a cartoon on the front. And then uh, these are examples of pouches. And obviously they, you can cut the chipboard and shape it in a way to make any form you want. It's very flexible. It uses very little, uh, well, there's no warp waste and uses very little weft yarns and very efficient way to weave a small project that you can take with you and shape in any way you like. Uh, for the workshop, we'll be making a little chipboard loom uh, similar to this. And this top part is actually the flap. And when you're finished, you push off the edges, pull out the chipboard, and you have a little pouch. And in the workshop, we'll, we'll be picking one of these sizes uh, to make, not the workshop, but the seminar. Uh, you have the, you can put beads on it or not. We put the beads on as we're putting the warp on the chipboard loom. So that's um, basically what the seminar is. It's just having a little fun and learning how you can actually shape a loom 
any way you want it to be. It's not restricted by any kind of parameters except what you're able to cut from chipboard. Okay, and so that's basically the the work, the seminar, and what we're going to do, and it should be a lot of fun. It usually is. Well, I have to jump in here and say that I actually took this session from you when you came to Atlanta. Okay, it was wonderful. It was a great pattern, and we taught it to some kids. We did it with some Girl Scouts. And it just turned out beautifully. So I, I can do a testimony here. <laughs> it's a great pattern and it's such a nice end result. You can put your phone in it. It was the kids loved it. Right. Anything right. for a phone. And adults do too. I've done it a lot with children, but inevitably the teachers get pulled in and start, you know, making their own. So yeah, I use mine that I made as a sample. I still use it. Great. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Connie. We appreciate you being here today. And uh, again, her class will be a three-hour seminar. It'll be July the 18th. It's a Monday. So if you have any interest in it, you want to sign up, you go to the website and you can sign up under Convergence Registration. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Karen Dondi. Karen's going to do Turned Biter Wand to Double Two Tie. It's a three-hour seminar. It will be Monday also, July the 18th. Hey, Karen. Hi, Kathy. Nice to see you again. You too. I'm just going to share my screen quickly here. Show some pictures. While I tell you about this uh, three hour super seminar. Um, this one looks at the similarities between two weaving techniques that on the surface don't seem like they have much in common. I actually became fascinated with Bond at Convergence 2010. Uh, I'd taken a workshop with Robin Spady. And what I loved was these clean pattern blocks I was getting. And yet I only needed eight shafts to create, or uh, three shafts to, eight, sorry, eight shafts to create three blocks. So when I got home, I tried to adapt this very traditional coverlet weave to a thin drapey scarf that two shuttle threading or treadling and the very fine yarns took me forever to weave. So I needed to find a more practical way to work with the structure. And after about my fourth day into weaving this particular scarf, I asked myself, what if I turn the draft? I had chosen per Robin's workshop to thread both of the traditional Bitervon warps with the same yarn. So when I turned the draft, I could now weave with one shuttle. What I didn't realize at the time was how much design potential this opened up for the new supplementary warp threading. There was a lot of more research and some helpful advice from others along the way. And I discovered that I could weave several different weave structures with this threading just by changing the tie up and the treadling. I played with that idea for a while and I actually taught the technique for the first time at Convergence 2012. I kept experimenting and teaching more workshops. And somewhere along the way, and I honestly can't recall when the light bulb went off, but I realized that the threading that results when you turn a Bidervon draft is a double two tie unit weave. So I pulled out my copy of Clotilde Barrett's and Eunice Smith's book, Double Two Tie Unit Weaves, had it on the library shelf, just had never looked at it. And I found there were some differences in how the blocks were arranged for some of those variations. This is an example of a uh, plated twill with the pattern shafts going in straight in point twill order there, one right after the other. But yes, if you look at it structurally, the threading unit with two tie down shafts and two pattern shafts per block was the same as for turned biter bond. Also, um, as I started to experiment, I quickly noticed some challenges creating effective double two tie designs from my uh, usual turned biter bond drafts. Most of those related to color selection and yarn size. So I dived into that, dived or dove, I never checked. So I dived into that Barrett Smith book and started looking at my turned Vitervon designs from the opposite direction. 
rather than designing for turned fighter bond and then plugging in a double two tie tie up and treadling, I started choosing colors and yarns and block arrangements that would work better for double two tie designs, particularly plated twills like this one. Then I adapted those drafts to weave turned biter bond or turned extended summer and winter or double weave windows or any of the other various structures that I had already been experimenting with. Here's another example using block patterns, more typical of turned biter bond and the double two tie variation. This seminar explores this relationship between the two weaves in more detail. Um, it is heavy into drafting, particularly computer drafting. So people have to be prepared for that when they sign up. But for those structure, I call them structure junkies like me, it feeds that need to solve design puzzles and with a multitude of different possible solutions. Also, the longer super seminar format is going to allow participants to practice the drafting technique and experiment with some designs, whether they're using a laptop that they've brought and their own weaving software, or maybe on graph paper and pencil with pencil. I'm going to provide one threading and we'll see how many different designs we can come up with with tie up and treadling variations. So if anybody has any questions, uh, you can reach me at the email address or check out my website for some more pictures. And I, I hope to see more people there. Thank you, Karen. Yeah, I just, I have to agree with our editor who just said, I candy. That is beautiful, <laughs> beautiful weaving. I, that's Thank wonderful. You. I encourage you all to check it out. Like you, she said, you can either go to our website or her website and you can learn more about this class. Again, it's a three hour seminar. It's on Monday, July the 18th. Thank you, Karen. Appreciate you being on here today. Thanks, Kathy. Next up, we have Marcy Petrini. Color Techniques for Simple Warps. This is a one-day workshop, which is Sunday, July 17th. Hey, Marcy. Hi, and thank you for having me here. And I will share my screen. Um, let's see. No, I don't want to read it. Zoom is being difficult here today. Let's see. Can you... Okay. There you go. Now we go. Okay. Uh, let me get, there we go. Okay. So as Kathy said, my um, one day workshop is color techniques for simple warps. So we're going to be weaving with uh, plain weave and doing some fun things on uh, plain weave, but we're also going to talk about how to handle the color under those circumstances. And um, these two monographs are going to be part of the class. There's going to be, there's a lot more in the monographs than we're going to be able to cover, but that's okay. You can go home and read it. So um, the interesting things about color to me is the um, landmark experiment that Joseph Albers did, oh, some 56 years ago, where he told the students, he's published in this uh, Interaction of Colors book. He told students to go and get um, an object of, uh, of the color Coca-Cola red. Now, Coca-Cola has been around since the late uh, 1800s. So everybody knows what Coca-Cola red is, right? Wrong. People showed up with all sorts of different reds. And what was interesting that people showed up with all sorts of different reds, even if they told them, it allowed them to match their red to, to a bottle of Coke, that time it was bottles. Um, so what does that mean? That means that we all see colors differently. So if I say red, I know which red I mean, but you don't know which red I mean. So how do we see color? So we really don't want to spend time thinking about theory. It's important, but not for um, the weaving that we want to do. And a list of colors and do and don'ts is also not very helpful. What we want to do is we need to discover how each one of us sees the color. Luckily, we, for example, how many colors are in this rainbow? Not always seven. Try it next time. So the interesting things is that the brain processes 
information uh, in a specific way. It's not, it's scientific, but it's not very difficult. But in you, we see things like uh, we can get color blending. We are the same color can look lighter or dark. And uh, a color that blends, like in, in this case, sometimes the one, one of the colors pops, other times it doesn't. So for example, for our, one of the most interesting brain process to me is that the brain first processes the outline of objects. So the brain looks at these um, yarns, warp and weft, without color. And after, well, obviously this is you know milliseconds, um, shorter than milliseconds, but after um, the outlines are there, the colors come in. So we see red warp and blue weft be because of these two steps. What if the brain can't see the outlines of these um, objects? Well, we get color blending. So all the uh, color blending that you've heard people talk about, that's what it is. It's our brain inability to be able to separate the different objects. So we'll talk about, the class. in the class, we'll talk about some of the other um, phenomena and how you can take advantage of them. Well, here is um, what, what can happen. Here is the warp is blue, blue, green, green. The weft is in the same order. On the diagonal, you have green and green and so forth. But look at all the other, um, how well they blend and they become new colors. And on the other side of it, here is a red warp. On, this, on the left, the, there's a, the same red weft. On the right is a more of an orange weft. So do you like a nice sedated fabric or do you like one that is vibrant and jumps around? So that's a personal decision. And it also may look different because you don't see the same reds that I see and vice versa. But it's not just plain weave tabby. We can arrange colors and modify where the colors are by using a wet face fabric. Um, on the left, on the right is a, um, it's a, actually a warp dominant. This is, was woven on a, uh, on a rigid heddle. And it's, it's a little bit hard to do a warp, um, totally warp face um, structure on a rigid heddle. Of course, you can do it on, on the floor loom. But here you see, you can barely notice the very fine weft of silk and, and more here. But the uh, cotton ribbon with all its stripes is very visible. And so that's what you see. It's really warp dominant. And then you can manipulate just two simple colors, red and black. You can have, you can go from black to red in a gradation, or you can do color and weave. So just two, diff, just two simple colors can give you an infinite amount of uh, possibilities. Of course, we've all woven stripes and plaids. I'm not a big stripe and plaid person, to be honest. But um, when I do them, I use different reds for the different sections. So this one has actually three. It's got a, a, a red, what I would call a true red, a darker red, and an orange red. And some of them disappears in different proportions. And here, when the plaids, I like to have them a little offset, you know, look more interesting. Um, I love variegated yarns, and there is a lot you can do with variegated yarns if you, if you manipulate them the way you want to, and you adjust the colors in the way that you find pleasing. So in the, in the first one is a warp and weft of the same, uh, with the same yarn. Uh, the next one is the warp is variegated. Well, this is both variegated in the first sample. The second one, the warp is variegated, but the, the uh, weft is, a, um, is purple. Is a, uh, but you see how the purple pops because you get different purples in the uh, variegation, but you also get a purple in the weft. Um, this one is the other way around. You have a um, blue, uh, dark blue, um, a warp with a variegated yarn and the yarn pools in some places. And sometimes it's a strike, sometimes a little darker. Hey, Marcy. Hey, Marcy. Yes. Hey, Marcy. Yeah. Let me, let me ask you a question. I saw that any kind of loom is good for this workshop, right? Yes. Yeah, so this would be great if you have a frame loom or if you just have a, you want to take a table loom, right? Right, right. Yeah. The only thing that is not going to work is a pin loom because okay. you can control the set. Okay. But if you can okay. control the set somehow, you know, rigid heddle, you have different heddles. Um, yeah, that will work. And, and actually, you can do what uh, Karen, you can get a mat that Karen showed and, and, and you make these. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. 
Well, I appreciate you bringing this forward because I think this will be a great workshop for anybody who doesn't want to haul a big loom. Exactly. Thank you so much, Marcy. If you want sure. to get more information about this, you can go to Marcy's website or you can go on our website and look uh, and read all about her class um, in the convergence registration. And again, it's color techniques for simple warps. It's a one day workshop uh, and it's on Sunday, July the 17th. Thank you, Marcy. You're welcome. Thank you. Next, we got Donna Foley. Donna is gonna talk about natural color, getting a complete palette from local and traditional natural dyes. This is a 90 minute work uh, seminar. And again, it's on Sunday, July the 18th. Hey, Donna. Hi, thanks for having me here in my studio. I'm a natural dyer from, we can see color really um, is what I do in my mainly tapestry work and natural dyes are the basis of that. Um, so I really started with local dyes. Um, there, my passion is collecting and using them. I've, I've even bought, written a little booklet on the local plants in the area that I live now. Um, but in order, I realized I needed to expand my palette um, from the yellow. Um, and so started my journey into the traditional dyes of indigo and cochineal matter root. Um, and in some ways I've come full circle. I really now just love what I get, honestly. But there are times when you just need a particular color. Um, you're trying to match something or you have all these wonderful, you're in the middle of a tapestry and you just know certain color will make things pop. So, um, that is when I started to uh, really try to create, you know, a complete palette, you know, purples right on through to the reds. Um, I mainly work in wool and it's mainly what I'll be talking with, but I've also done it um, in cottons. Let's see, full palette. Um, as I mentioned, the uh, dyes I like to use, let's see if I can do this. Uh, we'll talk a bit about mordanting, pretty important. Um, I will touch on some of the local plants that I use, lichens, here's Kota, but mostly it's going to be about making stock solutions of natural dye extracts. Um, I use the cochineal, um, well, actually indigo, I do not make a stock solution of, but we'll talk about how we can control the color getting that indigo on your yarn in a controlled way. Um, matter root, and then many times with the extracts, I'm actually using Osage orange or um, Kamala for the yellow shades. And by making these stock solutions, which means a lot of measuring, we'll talk about digital scales, millimeters, really got to get to the metric system. I'm sorry, but it makes everything so much easier. Um, once you make these stock solutions and you can add them in a controlled way to your dye pot. It is easy to make reproducible colors um, and being able to do gradations, um, you know, adding just a little bit more. This top one I believe is Kamala. Um, and it blues and greens. So, um, being able to make these complete gradations in one color or from going from uh, you know, one color graded to the next one in reproducible ways. Um, that means for me, stock solution. So I'm gonna be sharing my tips and tricks for creating uh, stock solutions and using them. Um, I also am planning on having just an indigo bath going, um, that, so you can see the magic of indigo. Um, and I believe some cochineal have going too, so we can do a bit of dyeing right in that seminar. But uh, main thing talking about stock solutions and making the color you want. So um, feel free to contact me. My website is fourdirectionsweaving.com or through uh, the Convergence HGA website. Thanks, Donna. So would you, would you say that this is a class for beginner dyers or advanced dyers or both? 
Yes, um, for both. I am such a passionate dyer. Whatever way the you know people want me to go, I'm happy to talk about natural dyes like forever. So as I said, I love the local, so I'd love to. We'll we'll be talking about mordanting, and once you understand the mordanting and what's happening, and some I will go into some things to think about if you're collecting dyes. So I would really encourage you know just anyone who is interested at all in uh, natural dyeing to to come on down. I think you'll uh, be able to see the breadth of what natural dyes can do. And then because I'll be talking with stock solutions, I don't think that should scare anyone. Um, it'll just like let you know that if it is indeed, if you're a more precise person and need to get a certain color, there is a way of doing it. Um, but in 90 minutes, it's going to be more a more general talk on natural dyes and, and reproducing color. So I'd say for everyone. Thank you, Donna. Everybody's so interested in natural dyes now. This will be a great seminar. And again, it is a 90 minute seminar. Um, it is July the 17th. Um, and if you want more information, you can go to our website or you can go to the HGA website. Thank you, Donna. Thank you. Next up, we have Deb Essen. Weaving with a supplemental warp without a second back beam. Magic. It's a two-day workshop. It's Tuesday and Wednesday, July 19th through the 20th. Hi, Deb. Hi, Kathy. How are you today? I am good. How are you? I'm excellent. It's snowing here. No, <laughs> is it? <laughs> hey, April is just being rude. Just rude. <laughs> So well, I won't I, tell you how nice it is here in Atlanta. So go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm delighted to be with everyone today. I'm waving to you all from far western Montana in case you're wondering where it's snowing. And the class that I'm going to be talking about is it's a two day workshop on weaving with supplemental warps. And it's an introduction to supplemental warps. And for those of you that might go, oh, do I know Deb's name? I did write a book on doing supplemental warps. Um, it came out on Interweave Press back in 2016. And it's currently right now out of print, but it is being reissued by Schiffer Publishing with more projects and another weave structure. And it is due out in September. So that's very exciting news. So. What we do in this workshop is that I will be teaching you how to get your loom set up so that you do not need a second back beam to weave a supplemental warp. And for those of you that are going, well, wait, wait what's a supplemental warp? What a supplemental warp is, is extra warps, or it can be one warp or it can be multiple warps that are working with your base cloth. And we work a lot with turned drafts. And what that does is it turns a two shuttle weave like overshot or monk's belt into a one shuttle weave so that you're weaving your base cloth and your pattern at the same time. And over my shoulder and my lovely studio assistant Esmeralda um, is one of the samples that I have of a overshot shawl that I did where it's bands of color that I was able to turn an overshot draft and then weave all these bands of color across the width of the shawl by using one shuttle. And it's really, really fun. And it really, really speeds up your two shuttle weaves. So in this class, um, you need a table loom or a floor loom, and you need at least four shafts. If you have a four shaft loom, then you will be doing our monk's belt. And before you poo poo monk's belt, monk's belt is the best way to go down the rabbit hole of design that I have ever had. Um, for example, um, this is one of the samples out of my actual book and I've taken blocks of monk's belt and you can probably maybe see is that there's two blocks, the big blocks and the little blocks. And then you can break those blocks apart so that you can change colors, you can change their placement on the fabric, you can do all sorts of things with size and, and playing around with that. I'm actually wearing a monk's belt scarf right now. 
And what this is, is once again, just two blocks of monk's belt. And it's done with a um, hand spun silk that I spun up and it's a variegated color. And you can see how the color just floats along in various parts, but I'm getting all of this different patterning with just two blocks of monk's belt as a turned supplemental warp. And in case you're wondering, well, I've heard supplementary. It's supplemental and supplementary are the same thing, literally the same thing according to Webster's Dictionary. And when I wrote the book, I had put in supplemental. And um, I have to admit, Anita Osterhaug, who was my editor at the time, and she was the um, editor of Handwoven, um, got hold of me and said, you know, we've been referring to it as supplementary. We probably should be consistent. And I said, well, you know, it means virtually the same. And since I'm planning on teaching this, I'd really rather say supplemental, which has only four syllables instead of supplementary that has five. And Anita said, okay, fine. And so that's why I say supplemental. Um, you can hear supplemental, you can say supplemental, or you can say supplementary. It's completely up to you. Same diff. One of the funnest things that um, if you have an eight shaft loom is we can do overshot. And this is just an overshot piece. And Esmeralda has an overshot piece as well. And what I have done is I've turned the draft and then I broke apart the overshot into different bands of pattern that I can weave all at the same time just by treadling away and throwing my one shuttle. And this particular one has um, different thread yarn. It's actually bamboo sock yarn. So here's the purple, here's a variegated, and here's a green, and then I repeated purple variegated green. So your options for weaving um, patterns just goes and goes and goes, and you can have so much fun. So what I'm gonna teach you is you'll be bringing a warp and so, um, you'll have the instructions emailed to you about a month before convergence. I will have you bring a warp all wound for both your base cloth and for your supplemental, very specific directions. We will be warping in class. And the reason we warp in class is because it is a very specific way of setting this up so that you do not need a second back beam on your warp. So um, we'll be setting it up, we'll be weaving our samples, and then we have a big show and tell reveal at the end of class. It's grand fun. Um, you should be at least a, um, at least an advanced beginner. You should be very, very comfortable with warping your loom independently, um, and then all the way up to your experienced. So I hope that some people will join us. It's, it is grand fun. I'm totally addicted and I will admit it. <laughs> Thanks, Deb. It sounds fascinating. And again, if you want more information, you can go to Deb's, Deb's uh, website or you can come to the HGA website and learn more about her class. And again, weaving with supplemental warps without a second back beam, magic. Two-day workshop, it's Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, the 19th and the 20th. Thanks, Deb. Thank you. I'm really bummed everybody's classes. I'm going, oh, that would be fun, but I'm teaching at that time. Oh, wait, oh, that would be <laughs> fun. Yeah. All right. And last but not least is Giovanna Imperia. Giovanna is going to be teaching weaving with non-traditional materials, an exploration of unusual, innovative, and just simply funky yarns. This is a three-day workshop that starts Tuesday and goes through Thursday. Hello, Giovanna. Um, hi. Here I am. Okay. Um, thank you for, uh, for this opportunity. This is going to be uh, a fun exploration uh, for a lot of people that are interested in doing more with their weaving that does not necessarily involve um, um, complex structures. Um, Giovanna, can the, you? Uh, interesting thing about um, innovative materials is, yes, I was just going to uh, ask you, 
there you go that's better we were yes there you go <laughs> yeah I, the, the latest version of uh, zoom on, on my ipad has all sorts of different features um so these are these are materials that come from um all sorts of different places some of them are industrial materials um such as the automotive industry um and um the architecture industry so they 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 have been developed to have certain applications certain properties that i think are very interesting to apply to our own weavings but what that means is that you really need to experiment uh, make notes and 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 explore design opportunities so you're not going to be able to um uh, do a scarf, for instance, with a thick yarn that is a steel core. It will never drape properly. So you kind of need to think about the materials that you have and what you can do. Um, we're not going to get down the, the, the rabbit hole of um, active yarns, such as crepe yarns and elastic yarns. There are other classes that cover those materials. I'm not going to get into that. What we're going to look at is different types of polyesters, different types so rubber um, and um, and some um, interesting um, uh, um, other interesting unusual materials. So I want to see. Can if, I interrupt you for just yeah. a second? Are you doing a screen yeah. share? Mm, I was hoping to see. I don't have a presentation. No, no, no. I just wanted to make uh, sure. I can't remember what we said you were going to do. I'm sorry to interrupt. Keep going. I, I was I was hoping. Well, I was hoping to be able to focus not on me but on the samples that i have and i think i can do it here we go hey we go. how about that there you go yeah i think i think this stuff is more interesting <laughs> so this is a good example of um an interesting application it's actually a uh, a vest that was designed by a german designer and um it uses uh, a um polyurethane coated yarn uh, so the core of the yarn is uh, cotton, I believe, and then it's dipped into uh, uh, polyurethane, which is an, a, a type of rubber. Um, and um, it does have a very interesting kind of suede feel to it, um, and it's fairly drapeable. And I, I like it a lot. It's a very interesting material. Um, you can do all sorts of different uh, things. So for instance, let me move that. This is a piece that I did where I use the same kind of yarn, but mine is thick and thin. And so you can see that it almost looks like an e-cut. The white is the polyurethane coated yarn. The beige is silk. And, and because it's thick and thin, you have these very interesting blocks. But by mixing it with silk, it remains fairly, um, fairly drapeable. Um, some of the other things that I, um, I, the students will explore is um, it's the, the uh, thermoplastic. I'm sorry, I was running out of words. Thermoplastic. So this is a good example of a, a bracelet. It's a it's a crochet bracelet. Um, darker spots is because when you apply heat to fuse the structure, uh, heat you apply, the more visible the core yarn will become. Um, and so I started messing around with this property and create kind of a, um, so the, the thermoplastic itself fuses onto itself. It doesn't become, um, a, a solid uh, structure. You still see, in the case of this bracelet, for instance, you clearly still still see the the, the the crochet stitches that I used, but they don't move. There is no there is no opening. There is no um, uh, really stretching, um, and it offers, um, for um, mats that to be used in cars where you want a stable, strong structure. Uh, I find they're very interesting also to use for uh, in weaving to do jewelry, for instance, as in the case of this piece here. Oops, sorry. 
right? So this was woven on uh, on a four shaft loom. So um, the uh, the double plastic comes in different sizes, different colors, um, and you play with 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 them with the, the, the sizes and the colors. There are two types. One has a steel core and the other one has a polyester core. Um, the benefit of having something that has a steel core is that it's more, um, it's stiff even before you start applying heat. So if you're thinking about sculptural pieces, it's very easy to work with something like that. Um, another material that we are going to explore the, uh, uh, the applications uh, in weaving is uh, it's this, it's not very interesting. As you can see, it looks like just any other white yarn, but it is, it is actually a polyester yarn that when you apply heat, it's, it becomes stiff. So I have seen applications in architecture, for instance, where the pieces have been shaped to fit a certain things like screens, for instance, for exteriors of building. And then they had been heated and so the shape the finished piece just does not move it's not like weaving with um, other kinds of polyesters that we may be familiar from other classes the piece Gi is a solid piece at that point yes Giovanna I'm going to have to cut you off dear I'm sorry thank you so much for all this information we've got a lot of questions no that's okay in. lots of questions coming in uh, somebody was asking they can use a four shaft loom correct Yes. yes yes okay yes good and and we're going to talk um yes i'll mention it a couple of times but um weaving with non-traditional materials if you are looking for something a little bit as she says funky here's your class it's an exploration of unusual and innovative and just simply funky yarns it's a three-day workshop lots to learn in three days tuesday through thursday july 19th through the 21st thank you giovanna Just thank remember, you. Thank you. I hope to see a bunch of people there. Yes. You can register online at wespendie.org. Also, re remember that you can see the, you can download the materials list for any workshop, any session, if there is a materials list. And that may help you decide, oh, do I have a floor harness or what are we going to do? What do I need to bring? So be aware that material is available to you before you register and you'll find out um, all the things that you will have to have for a particular workshop, or if there's anything. So register online. Um, new hotels. I've had a couple of calls today even about the hotels. The Marriott is pretty much full. You can try it. Crown Plaza, Knoxville. Uh, lots of rooms there. They have a shuttle if you would rather ride back and forth from your hotel. The Hyatt is uh, available. The Cumberland House is uh, two blocks away. So uh, be sure you use the link. Someone else asked about that. You won't get the discount if you don't use the link. So be sure to go to the website, check the link, and make your hotel reservations today. I hope you'll join us in Knoxville. It is July 15th through the 21st. Lots to do and see. Um, if you go online, we have plenty of information about all the activities. We still have openings at some of our um, juror talks, if you're interested in seeing that and we've got classes available. Please join us. And thank you so much for joining this afternoon. We have a couple of more sessions coming up about more classes if you're interested, and you can see all that online on our website. Thank you and have a great afternoon.